everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, July 7th, 2019. Rest in peace, Calvin. <laughs> we hardly knew ye. Literally, we hardly knew him. Within our little soap world, Calvin was born to die <laughs> within the span of one week's time. I don't know what to think about this guy. The beginning of the week, Chelsea was describing him as a kind, gentle old man, an adopter of children. Midweek, he was giving me a sinister, creepy vibe, and by Friday, he was dead. <laughs> I don't know. Every single word out of Chelsea's mouth about Calvin was about what a great husband he's been to her, what a great father he's been to Connor, but then he paid this sneaky secret visit to Adam telling Adam that he was there because he thought he could help him. And we didn't actually see that conversation. That's what's bugging me. I want to know what happened in that conversation between Adam and Calvin. Calvin just showed up at the door, told Adam that he could help him, and then all of a sudden, next day, Calvin is popping up behind Chelsea like a ghost or something. I mean, she's busy on her date with Nick and her annoying husband pops up out of nowhere behind her. And she was so uncomfortable with his presence. Just even him being there made her completely change her vibe. Suddenly, I, I was just getting the impression that <laughs> Calvin was holding Chelsea hostage or something, or, or maybe he was blackmailing her into that marriage, that something on the up and up was not going on there, that it just wasn't a legitimate marriage. After all, Chelsea did tell Nick that she met Calvin through Anita. So he was somehow tangled up with Chelsea's mom, which means he was either a mark or another con. I'm not sure. And then out of the blue, on Friday, Calvin tells Chelsea that he just wants to give her son away, wants to give Connor back to Adam so that they can start their own family without her pesky kid in the way. What the heck? <laughs> I don't know. Did where did that even come from? I, I, I'm still perplexed because I'm wondering what happened during the conversation between Calvin and Adam that made him completely change the way he felt about Connor. At the beginning of the week, Calvin is fully embracing Connor as part of his own family, he even adopted the child. End of the week, he's wanting to give him away back to his real father. Did Adam cast a spell? on Calvin? Did Adam pl plant a, a, some sort of chip in Calvin's brain and then flip the switch? There's just no way that that was about to conveniently work out in Adam's favor. Um, Adam and Calvin had to have been working together somehow. Adam was about to get exactly what he wanted via Calvin. We know that Adam was having Calvin and Chelsea and Connor followed, so maybe they were in cahoots all along? Is it possible that Adam's been working with Calvin all along? There's just no way that was about to work out in Adam's favor, and there's also no way it was about to work out in Chelsea's favor. I mean, Calvin was about to swing custody of Connor over to Adam and then he just drops dead mysteriously? I don't think so. From Chelsea's perspective, Calvin dropping dead worked out for her. It put an end to all of the nonsense that he was just talking about and also it freed her up to start dating again. How do you go from Adam Newman 
to Calvin, Calvin Bordreau or whatever his name was. Does Calvin wear all black and make sex eyes at you, Chelsea? I don't think so. <laughs> it's pretty clear that that was some type of marriage of convenience, right? She could not have felt passionate about Calvin the way she felt passionate about Adam. Emotionally, I can understand her not wanting to fall over herself to have a big reunion with Adam, though. Chelsea had to overcome his death, and she had to learn how to live without him. So it makes sense to me that she wouldn't be in a big rush to unravel herself, to undo all of the years of that psychological process that she had to go through in dealing with his death. But I also don't entirely understand why Chelsea would want to keep Adam from Connor. I don't understand why she would want to let Connor think that his father is dead now that he's not. <laughs> I'm struggling to make that leap. Maybe it's just me. I think that is a good place for a poll question this week at yrchat.com. Should Chelsea let Adam have access to Connor? Were you buying her argument that it's best for Connor to keep Adam away? Or were you understanding where Adam was coming from and thinking that he is deserving now to have access to his son Connor. Go to the website at yrchat.com and vote in that poll. Tell me who you think is right here. Because from my perspective, I'm thinking, okay, Chelsea, definitely take your time in telling the kid. It makes sense that you might want to get a counselor for him and figure out how would be the best and most healthy way to transition Adam back into the child's life. But pretending that it's not happening and just putting your head in the sand and acting like Adam's not alive is not fair to Adam and it's not fair to Connor. What exactly did Adam ever do to Chelsea or to Connor that would make him deserve being cut out of Connor's life. There's a difference between the paternity issues of Connor versus Christian, the son that Nick is raising. Adam switched Christian's paternity test results. Adam willingly and knowingly manipulated that situation so that he would not be the one raising Christian. Adam chose not to be Christian's father. And that is not the case with Connor. Adam didn't make any choices when it came to raising Connor. Adam wanted to raise Connor. Adam had nothing but a desire to build that family with he and Chelsea. So I don't fully understand why Chelsea is putting up that roadblock and maybe it is just because she is selfish. Maybe she is only seeing this from her own perspective. It hurts her too much to now let Adam back into her life. But she needs to step it up, I think, and understand that her relationship with Adam can be separate than, uh, you know, than her son's relationship with Adam. It just doesn't make sense to me. It also doesn't make sense to me why Nick is so fully willing to forgive and forget when it comes to Chelsea. What fortune cookie and Nick is pretty much ready to get back together with her. Is it the female in the room effect that we've talked about many, many times? <laughs> Currently, Chelsea is the female in the room, and so I guess Nick is somehow powerless against her influence. Chelsea ditched 
Nick and the life that they were building together, the blended family that they were building together. Connor and Christian had become like brothers. And Chelsea freaked out, ran away, took Connor with her, and almost took Christian with her too. I mean, here's a situation where, okay, Chelsea ended up leaving Christian with Nick, the man who she believed was a, a, the person who would be the real best parent for Christian, but she also ripped Connor out of Nick's life. I mean, we spent a lot of time hearing Chelsea talk this week about how much she loves Christian. Well, Nick loved Connor and Chelsea ripped Connor away from Nick. So I would think that Nick would be as hesitant to let Christian around Chelsea as he was to let Christian around Adam. I don't understand why the double standard there. <laughs> Frankly, everyone has wanted to snatch Christian at some point. Maybe that's why he wanted to forgive her. Everybody's tried to steal Christian away, so I'm willing to let that one pass. <laughs> or maybe it's just her demeanor. Chelsea was so instantly apologetic in all of her conversations with Nick that it, it won Nick over. I mean, she immediately told him how much she regretted what had happened between them. She immediately told him that she thinks about Christian all of the time. That must have scored her points with Nick. Big points, I assume. I can't be uh, entirely dismissive of Chelsea though because I did appreciate where she was coming from and I did appreciate those conversations that she had with Nick. A lot of Chelsea's behavior right before she ran away from town she explained as having been a part of her upbringing that because Anita was her mother and because they were a little con artist mother daughter team Chelsea has always had it in her head that you need to have an escape plan you always have to be looking for that way out and then you need to vanish as fast as you can. So that explanation that she gave to Nick actually put a lot of context into my mind as to why she left town the way she did. It never sat right with me that she blew up her entire life out of nowhere and, and then just ran away. But I felt like Chelsea explained it pretty well and Nick totally accepted it. He even offered to let her see Christian. He invited her to go with he and Christian to the carnival together. And then he invited Chelsea back to his house, let her see Christian's room. And I think it was probably mostly because he was looking for an ally. I think that's also how Nick sees Chelsea, someone who he can team up with against Adam and any moves that Adam might be making for, you know, making a play for custody of those two kids. But Nick was so invested in Chelsea this week that it came off as shocking to me. Not only did he listen to her and give her court, to explain everything that had been in her mind, but he invited her to the carnival, invited her to his house, and then later they went out for dinner. <laughs> it was like they had a day long date, like two people who wanted to be together, two people who were reuniting right before our very eyes. And Nick, did also try to get Chelsea to open up about her life after she left Genoa City and specifically what the deal with Calvin was, but Chelsea was very tight-lipped. All she said was that she apparently skirted around for most of the time. I mean, she was having to dodge people who were looking for her, including Victor, and it was only about 
think she said eight months ago when she ended up in Louisiana. She met a man who was involved with Anita. It sounded like Anita had her sights on him for one reason or another. But for one reason or another, Chelsea ended up marrying him instead. Weird. Something is definitely not right about that situation. It was not a marriage of love, which is what I was expecting when Calvin popped up on our screen. He was not the husband that I was thinking Chelsea would have. I thought it would be Chance or maybe some hot French dude. <laughs> and then Calvin? <laughs> Chelsea seemed like she just wanted to get away from him when he showed up at Nick and Chelsea's dinner date. He was giving me stalker vibe. He had tracked her down. Apparently she told him that she had gone off to a spa. She was going to be on a spa retreat and he found out that she was lying, sending flowers to the spa. Okay, this sounds like obsession. He decides to just track her down instead. He follows her to Genoa City, interrupts her dinner with Nick, and has this very menacing presence the entire time. He sits down and tries to have a conversation with Nick, but he also seems to have this weird control over Chelsea. Her entire demeanor changed. She seemed nervous the entire time. And then when Chelsea and Calvin, Calvin got up to leave, walked out the door, the look that she gave Nick through the glass windows of the restaurant was like, help me. It is so sad and gross. The way that Kevin is letting himself be pushed around and used and manipulated by Adam and soon Phyllis is going to join the show and she's going to start doing the same thing. Kevin is suddenly <laughs> going to become Phyllis and Adam's whipping boy. Ooh. Does Kevin not have any self-respect? Could he grow some cojones and stand up to these two? Or could Michael please get along with whatever it is that his plan is going to be to take down Adam? Like, somebody needs to get on this because Kevin is really in a bad spot. Can you even believe that Phyllis smelled Kevin's cologne, took one whiff of the scent that he was wearing, and was cued in instantly to the fact that he was her kidnapper. That is so something that I would do. I just identified with that so much because my sense of smell is so keen. So I was in that moment where she's just having a conversation with him and all of a sudden the smell hits her and she just grabs him by the collar. She just knows instantly that he was the kidnapper. Ah, oh, that was good. Really good. And Kevin tried to play it off, of course. <laughs> he was like, you know what, Phyllis? Half of the men in Genoa City probably wear this cologne. It's not, I'm not your kidnapper. It couldn't be me. I mean, this cologne, it's probably that old grandma perfume that Billy had discontinued from the Chabot line. Everybody's wearing it. Anybody could have been the kidnapper. I thought that was really funny. I mean, I, I think all of the scenes between Phyllis and Kevin have been exceptionally funny, but I also think they are going to get dark. Phyllis is the kind of person who holds a grudge and now she knows Kevin was the one behind her kidnapping. I feel sorry for him. <laughs> I really do. One little interesting scene was when Kevin got reunited with his best bud, Mariah. He sees her at the coffee house. They start catching up. He confides in Mariah that something whack is going on with his life, that he's made some enemies. And she's curious to know what exactly is going on with him. And I have a feeling she might figure it out. But Kevin started 
started out on their first conversation feeling like he didn't know what he was going to do, feeling a little lost in the mystery situation. But then there was another follow-up meeting between Kevin and Mariah where Kevin completely changed his attitude. All of a sudden, he had adopted the power of positive thinking. And I'm wondering if that means that Kevin knows something that we as the audience don't know yet. I wonder if Kevin knows that maybe Michael's plan against Adam has been put into motion. <laughs> so who's gonna strike who's gonna strike first? Are Phyllis and Adam gonna strike Kevin first or is Kevin gonna strike them first? did let Phyllis in on the secret that he had nothing to do with her kidnapping. In retrospect, I think it's a little funny that Adam let Phyllis think that. He was perfectly fine to let Phyllis think he was behind the kidnapping, that he had ordered Kevin to kidnap her. It was almost like Adam wanted Phyllis to feel a little afraid of him, to think that he was a little more of a loose cannon than he was, but he ended up telling Phyllis that it was all Kevin's idea, he had nothing to do with it, and that the reason <laughs> it happened in the first place was that Kevin was trying to get at Adam, and Kevin thought that Phyllis and Adam were an item, which... Phyllis and Adam, as an item, is sounding more and more appealing to me as time goes on. There's a little bit of a spark there. Phyllis seems to be the only person in this town who is operating on Adam's level, who is meeting Adam at his level, and I am definitely finding that potential very intriguing. All in all, I am finding Michelle Stafford as Phyllis to be very intriguing. I still love Gina and thank Gina, but man, Michelle Stafford is killing it. She is a way better actress than I think she used to be. I really think that she's grown a lot. She kills it in her scenes with Adam. She kills it in those scenes with Kevin. There's just this sexy, comedic element to her delivery that is just so totally unique to Michelle Stafford. I laughed at the scenes where she was at the carnival and she was shooting targets <laughs> and there was this poor carny guy <laughs> behind the booth who was probably so turned on by the fact that she was just sexily shooting these targets. I have a feeling that that carny guy would have given Phyllis all the stuffed animals if she would have wanted them. He would have given her all the prizes if she would have wanted them. But there are, there's no amount of carnival tickets that's gonna win you some friends. Ah, but who needs friends when you can have enemies? Those are just as fun, right? I am so loving this dynamic of Phyllis and Adam, and I love that Phyllis went to the trouble of hosting a party with the, a, a, a dark, horse logo emblazoned cake because if you're gonna have a party you gotta have a, a logo emblazoned giant cake and she also had lots of champagne and shrimp cocktails probably invited half of genoa city and only three people showed up at the party <laughs> none of them we're happy to be there. Michael and Lauren showed up only out of obligation to their friend, and Phyllis was seething at Michael the entire time about Kevin's kidnapping. That played so much more comedically than I thought it was going to. I thought it was gonna be dark, but surprisingly, a lot of Phyllis's scenes are being played comedically right now, and it's just so awesome. Lauren picked up on it though. She knew there was something going on between her husband and Phyllis, and she mentioned it too, Jack. 
Jack, who was the only other party attendee, Lauren said, there is something going on between those two. And I wonder if she's gonna figure out what it is and be very, very mad at Michael. <laughs> That was a good scene though. It was a it was a miserable time for everyone. <laughs> oh well, let them eat cake. Let Phyllis eat cake. I there was just something so entertaining about the watching the beats of that party and also watching Phyllis kick everyone out when they weren't playing by her rules, when they weren't giving enough adulation to her. It, it wasn't the party that she envisioned. So she made them hand back their half-drank cocktails. <laughs> Literally went around and collected everyone's drinks and kicked them out the front door. Then sat down on the couch in Adam's living room, eating directly out of that giant cake with a regular sized single fork. <laughs> that was fun. That was some good t comedic TV right there. And again, I am not going to lie. There was also some potential porcupine sexiness when Adam finally showed up to the party that was happening at his own house that he had nothing to do with. I am telling you guys, <laughs> why even throw a party? Why wait for the party to come to them? Phyllis and Adam could make their own party. I loved this week's carnival set the genoa city carnival this was such a fun summer treat i just i'm in love with carnival themes anyway so i am gaga over the genoa city carnival that set was awesome and it was extensive too that took some work some labor went in to build in that set i screen capped an overview shot of it and put it at the website if you want to see it was uh, at yrchat.com the set was pretty big it was pretty elaborate really but it was also very well detailed it was decorated to the nines there was a lot of little interesting touches if you actually stopped and looked around so it was really very impressive on a technical level but also on a story level i really liked that we got to see our town billionaires like victor and devon walking around and hobnobbing with the rest of genoa city society the normies <laughs> It's just so cool to see our larger than life characters walking around on a, a very common stage in a way. Like if anybody has ever been to a city fair though, or even the state fair, it is so much less glamorous than that Genoa City Carnival, let me tell you. I, I, let, let's just say the crowds at actual fairs are far less attractive <laughs> it is it is not a whole lot of models and extras wandering around in the background i mean none of the carnivals i've ever been to anyway any uh, carnivals or fairs that i've ever been to are just sweaty and greasy and gross and drunk let's not forget drunk <laughs> There's a lot of that going on in those beer tents. I think in that way, Summer and Theo were representing the reality of what carnivals really are. They were, Summer had snuck in a flask full of, I don't know what, maybe vodka or something, and they were drinking it off in the corner. That's a little closer to what I would have experienced, some stumbling around at the, the carnival. <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely way better than reality because in reality it's just a waft of cheap beer fumes and puke. <laughs> the Genoa City Carnival was far more glamorous and so that's where I would want to be.
is it time for Devon to let go of Hillary? Last week, that was our poll question, and 61% of you felt that Devon should be managing his own grief and letting go of Hillary in his own time. It was 39% of you who felt that Anna and Nate were right to encourage Devon to move on. Um, I tell ya, I voted with the majority there. I really felt like Devon needed to do what Devon needed to do and didn't need any help from anyone else. The scenes of him packing up Hillary's belongings this week were really, really hard. Devon would pick up a bauble a little something and it would trigger a memory and then he would tell Elena and Anna the story behind it. It was a cool way to show flashbacks of Hillary but it was also very bittersweet. I don't feel like Devon really needed to pack up all of Hillary's items or memories, and I certainly don't think he needed to get rid of them. I mean, I'm glad that he felt okay doing it. I'm glad that he was being listened to, at least throughout it. He was being indulged. They listened to all of his stories. They weren't rushing him, uh, but it felt still a little bit coerced, a little bit forced, like Devon didn't really want to be doing it, but he was doing it because he felt like he should. I just don't even understand why he had to give up these things. What is wrong with keeping tangible items that evoke a memory of a loved one who's now gone? For people like me who have terrible long-term memories, Sometimes that's all we have. I, you know, I like having, looking at something and it, it, it reminds me of the past. <sighs> but I guess he's not even gonna have that anymore. He didn't send Hillary's items to storage. He donated a lot of stuff to the local church, which is of course very nice and it's very on brand with who Devon is. But he and Elena and Anna, when all was said and done, ended up having this big group hug and it was supposed to be a happy healing moment. But I just kept thinking, I wish that we could have skipped this whole sidestep about Hillary. I was fine with Devon and Elena moving on already. I know it feels hollow for me, to be making another prediction about Anna when my last prediction was so very clearly wrong. <laughs> I was completely convinced for weeks that YNR was working on building a love triangle between Anna and Tessa and Mariah, but now I'm wondering if the triangle is going to be Anna and Theo and Summer. I'm sure that's what we're all thinking now. Devon has made good on his promise to hire someone to oversee Anna and her part of the music business, especially after she went ahead and released Tessa's music video without Devon's permission. I think Anna was hoping that Devon would see what a success it was and then he would change her mind and it would turn everything around. But Devon still sees some problems with the video. He doesn't feel that it's at the professional level that he wants things that are coming out of his company to be released at. He thinks that it could have been better and he believes that Anna has some room to grow before she's gonna get there and be able to deliver the quality that he's looking for. So he wants to hire someone to help her make sure that she's gonna do that, that she's gonna get there. And Anna seemed really okay with it. She seemed to come around to his understanding until Devon went and hired Theo to be the one to oversee her. Theo doesn't really even have that much more experience. Where did he even come from? And he's not that much older than her. Theo is apparently a former music industry star 
but he's been working mostly on marketing and branding lately, which is something that Devon doesn't really seem to value. I mean, that's that's really not where his head has been at, like cross placements. He didn't like the fact that there was Jabot Collective product featured prominently in that video of Tessa's. So I don't know why he would even choose Theo, who seems to represent that uh, type of thinking. I don't know why he would want Theo to be the one to oversee Anna, and uh, that's how Anna feels too. She's totally offended that Devon would pick someone like Theo to be the one to oversee her, and she doesn't hide that fact at all. Even from Theo, she lets him know that she doesn't like it. She totally explains the dynamic that's going on behind the scenes there, uh, and maybe, maybe she'll turn it around, maybe he'll turn it around, and I don't know. It seems like it's a, it's a, 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 a foot to start out on that has a little bit of tension. There's definitely some, some tension that's gonna be going on underneath the surface between Anna and Theo, and we all know what happens to tension sooner or later. Let's just hope that for Anna's sake, there is never any reason that Theo needs to be shirtless and serving her drinks because I think that Anna's head might explode. Summer got so drunk at that carnival. She was even looser than normal. And Summer's usually pretty loose. <laughs> And she was more cynical than normal. And Summer's usually pretty cynical lately. She became surly Summer. <laughs> and she was spouting off to Theo about Kyle every 10 seconds or so, completely oblivious to the fact that Theo is sitting right there, really, really into her, would really be happy to help her move on. And, you know, I gotta hand it to him. He just got so tired of her complete lack of self-awareness that he finally just got up and left, went to a business meeting in Austin a day early, and left summer at the coffee house, drowning in her espresso and water bottle vodka. She deserved it. It was good. I also thought it was really good how Phyllis came along to help her. She just saw Summer sitting there, looking a little green, and really zeroed in on the fact that her daughter was needing comfort and a ride. <laughs> a ride home because she was way too wasted but comfort you know she phyllis helped her back to her hotel room gave her some aspirin and they had this wonderful huggy mommy daughter moment between them that seemed like it was going to be a new beginning phyllis even tucked summer into bed and laid down beside her and i was thinking this could be a new era for Phyllis and Summer. They could become a mother-daughter bad girl team. Maybe Summer can even move in with Phyllis. Phyllis is apparently, on behalf of Dark Horse, having a whole hotel built. That's what her party was meant to celebrate. She's using the Dark Horse resources and getting a new penthouse out of it. Yay! Phyllis is going to have a brand new penthouse soon. I wonder if Michelle Stafford had it in her contract that Phyllis should get a hot new house if she was going to come back to the show. <laughs> I bet it's going to be great. I mean, if they are building and styling this around our new Phyllis, I think I'm going to be in love. I'm ready for a cool new penthouse set. And maybe we'll even get a little cafe or something that will indicate that it's a whole hotel. I mean, it's not just the penthouse. We're, there's going to be a hotel. Which, now that I think about it, I wonder if this new hotel is supposed to replace the athletic club? Is that right? Is it, is it possible we're going to get some new hotel rooms too? Hmm. I mean, YNR is definitely... Um, pushing the athletic club to the side, right? Because even uh, when we don't, we don't really go there anymore. We don't really see that restaurant anymore. And even Chelsea was mentioning how she came back to town and things have changed. And now she's eating with Nick at Society instead of at the old stuffy athletic club. 
Hmm. Maybe that's true. Maybe, maybe, maybe we needed a little breath of fresh air. So maybe a hotel will give us that. And I, I guess we have Phyllis and Adam to thank for that. I want more of Summer and Phyllis being loving and friendly and cool. I mean, Phyllis forgave Summer when Summer lost her mind and became a troublemaker last year. So why can't Summer forgive Phyllis when she's trying? I think maybe Phyllis just needs to make more efforts. You can't just forgive someone for making an effort one time. We need to see Phyllis continuing to try to make inroads with her daughter and then maybe Summer will forgive her. Or maybe Nick will help Summer see that. I mean, you never know. He could try to bridge the, the gap. I mean, I think that Summer and Nick hanging out was really good though too. Watching movies, eating Chinese food. I was impressed with how Nick handled Summer. Summer was complaining about how Phyllis is acting and how Phyllis treated Nick specifically. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Nick has every reason to hate Phyllis. I am shocked that he has had as many civil conversations with Phyllis as he had. I mean, Phyllis was partnering with Adam to try to destroy his life, stole his company out from under him, is sitting in his chair right now and is a, a, an ally to Adam who's trying to get custody of Nick's son. So I, I'm shocked at Nick's attitude toward Phyllis, but I'm also impressed with the fact that he encouraged Summer to not get caught up in between whatever's going on with her parents because Summer, ha Summer is the kind of person who generates enough drama all of her own that she does not need to get involved in anyone else's. I do kind of eventually want to see Summer and Kyle find their way back together because I think those two actors had some really great chemistry. But for now, I do also think that Summer needs to find a way to get past it. I think it would be nice if we could see Phyllis mustering up some motherly advice and helping Summer with her man troubles. <laughs> Not that Phyllis has a lot of uh, good experience in helping any kind of man troubles, but I also felt for Phyllis during those scenes where she was connecting with Summer after a long time. Phyllis probably realized in those moments that Summer is a lot like her. Summer is her daughter and is following in a lot of the same patterns that she has. I, I don't know, I just like seeing Phyllis being crazy and doing her things. I'm shocked that I'm even saying that, but I'm just loving Phyllis's whole everything right now. But I, I think it would really be topped off nicely by seeing Phyllis realizing that she's also a mom and using Summer as a grounding point for herself. Because I think they both need it. I mean, if Phyllis seeing Summer can help bring her back to some level of groundedness and maybe Summer, I, I don't know, needing her mom might pull her back in. No matter how old you are or how evolved you think you are, you're always gonna need your mom. <laughs> I think I'm projecting because those scenes with Phyllis and Summer in the hotel room made me hope that I'm gonna have close moments with my daughter like that someday, even when she is grown. I just hope that my daughter is not completely sloshed <laughs> for it to happen. <laughs> and also I really hope that my daughter doesn't ghost me the next morning, leaving a note on the pillow like it was a one night stand. Thumbs up for Lola's mom. I really like her. There's an element of her that seems very down to earth and very relatable. She definitely has a sweet smile and a certain sensibility about her, but <laughs> she also seems like she could be a troublemaker and I'm looking forward to that. I mean, Celeste and Jack are practically engaged already. <laughs> Forget. Kyle and Lola's wedding. That is old news. I am pretty sure that Jack and Celeste 
are off in the corner right this very moment making their own wedding plans. <laughs> Jack has probably already picked out the ring. <laughs> oh, I hope we get to keep her. I think this is going to be fun. I thought it was funny how Kyle and Lola assumed that Mrs. Rosales, Mama Rosales, was going to be way more uptight than she was. And at, like, because as soon as she arrives in town, Kyle and Lola realize that Mama does not realize that they are living together in sin. So naturally, they try to lie. They try to cover it up. Kyle runs back to the apartment and tries to remove any traces of himself or anything male. <laughs> So that Lola and her mom can stay at the apartment. Lola's mom wants, you know, thinks her daughter's single or at the moment and is living in this apartment alone and is going to start her married life with her husband in a supper spot or something. Uh, so Kyle goes, removes all his stuff. Lola's mom goes and stays the night. Kyle goes to stay the night at the pool house and tries to act like he's been living at the Abbott Mansion all along to cover this up. Well, the next evening, the Abbots are hosting a welcome to the family Celeste and Lola party. And Kyle is pretending that he lives at the mansion. He even pulled Tracy into the ruse, <laughs> only to have the curtain dropped on him when it's revealed that Celeste knew all along that Kyle and Lola were lying to her. Celeste revealed it at the apartment to Lola, and she did not get around to contacting Kyle soon enough to let him know about all of that. It was it was a, a funny little scene, and it added some charm to that welcome to the family party. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm getting really positive um, vibes from what this character is going to bring to the show. I think it's very mom-like that she knew the truth about Lola and Kyle and she knew they were lying and she didn't say anything but she let Lola keep on lying and was able to manipulate her way into a place to stay out of it. I mean it sounds like Mrs. Rosales got exactly what she wanted. She doesn't want to stay at the athletic club. She wants to stay with her daughter in that apartment and she found a, a way to do it. She's going to be staying with Lola in that apartment until the wedding day. <laughs> Kyle's going to be forced to stay at the pool house the whole time. Just probably wanting to be with Lola. And probably they're going to be sneaking around to steal moments together. I am sure that Celeste living in that apartment is going to give Kyle and Lola an incentive to hurry along with these wedding plans. The wedding's probably going to be happening sooner rather than later now. <laughs> and I'm, I am worried though. I do feel a little worried that Celeste is going to be inserting herself a little too dominantly on, his, on her daughter's life. I think that Lola's going to have to realize that she's making an independent decision to get married. This is the beginning of her independence from that family and she's joining a new family so now would be a good time to start standing up to mom because I have a feeling that mom is going to try to take over their wedding plans. It makes me a little sad though. I think, oh, come on, come on. Leave these kids alone. Let them have their wedding however they want to have it. And Mama Rosales can just save all those other plans for her own wedding to Jack in a couple months. I do have some suspicion about Celeste, though. I'm not totally won over. She could still be a bad girl, but, or like a bad girl on a way extra bad level. Because she was cozying up to Tracy a little too much. She was acting like she was Tracy's best friend and biggest fan, saying she has read all of Tracy's books and she was asking for a preview of the next one. It just almost seemed 
too convenient. Almost like Celeste had done a lot of research on the Abbots before she came to Genoa City. Almost seemed like she wanted to make sure that she maximized this opportunity and made the very best impression that she could. Cozying up to Tracy, making comments about how handsome Jack was. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, I just, I don't know. I find it entertaining. I think the actress has a, a really great delivery. And I think that Celeste is having some perfect timing, too, because Jack is single. And he is open to dating. And also, Tracy's kind of occupied right now with Kane. She's going to be a little too busy to keep an eye on anything that Jack's going on. Got Jack going on. And Jack noticed again this week that something seemed to be going on between Tracy and Kane. Because Tracy invited Kane to this Abbott Rosales family party. And Jack definitely took note about that. So yeah, Kane, Kane's coming to family parties. You know, Jack has invited women to family parties way sooner. I mean, he was bringing Carrie into Thanksgiving and Christmas pretty uh, quick, a whole lot, and he knew her a whole lot less than Tracy knows Kane. <laughs> I loved that she invited him to that. I loved that Tracy and Kane took a little stroll around the carnival together. As soon as I saw the carnival set and I realized that select characters were going to be able to get to attend this carnival, I started chanting, please let it be Tracy and Kane. Please let it be Tracy and Kane. This would be the perfect date for them. And it was. Yay! <laughs> Tracy decided to spin another one of her tales about Flynn and Iris just for Kane's entertainment. I'm starting to think that maybe this turns them both on. <laughs> that they get a little something extra out of this. It's like a little foreplay game or something. And I wholeheartedly approve. <laughs> Um, but there was also a poignant moment to it all. It wasn't all fun and games. I was a little sad that Tracy started talking to Kane about needing to eventually go back to New York City. She's going to have to work on the publishing aspect of her book, but also she lives there. I mean, that's mainly where her home is. I hadn't thought about it, but Tracy's mostly just visiting in Genoa City. She's kind of on an extended leave or an, a vacation, and it makes me sad to think that this is going to be over someday. But Kane did say, you know what? Actually, I was thinking about going to New York City. What do you know? If you're going to go there, maybe I could stop by. We could go see an offbeat play together. We could go to a jazz club together and just, you know, hang out. Wink, wink. Date. Wink, wink. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. But it also just made me realize that this summer romance is probably going to have a shelf life. I mean, eventually everybody's got to come home from their summer vacations when the summer vacation is over. I don't know. Maybe Tracy's going to eventually go back to her life and Kane is going to eventually go back to his life. And Oh, I guess if this romance has to end, I hope it ends on good terms. You know, the more I think about it, though, unless Y&R is going to develop a full-fledged relationship for Tracy and Kane, then I think the reality is it's probably best if Tracy ends up letting Kane down easily or that if it's if it's her saying, ah, I gotta go away now or I gotta go back or if you know if, if I think that if the relationship or trust or whatever it is is gonna need to end I think it's best if Tracy does the one doing is the one doing a little bit of heartbreak right that's the way it's got to be last Friday we left off with Billy fondling the Abbott family handgun 
And this week, we left off with Billy fondling a carnival pellet gun <laughs> right as Adam was strolling along behind him in the background. What the heck was the Prince of Darkness doing at the Genoa City Carnival? <laughs> was he harvesting souls, perhaps? Because I can't think of any other reason why Adam would be there. <laughs> Adam looked way too slick and way too evil to be strolling around so casually and so close to a rack of balloons. <laughs> it was just a, it was a visual mix of these two things don't go together. <laughs> oh, uh, what, what's going on here? Is Billy about to shoot Adam? Is that what's happening? Because Adam already got shot two months ago. Shouldn't there at least be a waiting period before anyone is eligible to shoot him again? Anger rots you from the inside. Forgiveness is good for the soul. That was our quote from last week. And surprisingly, Phyllis said it. She had this really great wise line as she was delivering her gift basket of forgiveness to Jack. Anger rots you from the inside, but forgiveness is good for the soul. I mean, there's such a, a really great comedic portrayal going on with Phyllis, but just that little bit of, of, of wisdom added something extra. It really bolsters the character. I thought that was a great moment. Uh, only a few of you guessed that it was Phyllis because it's it's like it's it's also the opposite of what her behavior is demonstrating. She seems to be all about revenge and enemies and yet here is an instance where I think she knows what the right thing to do is which is forgiveness but she is choosing the the bad path which I am enjoying by the way. Well a, a few of you guys did guess it right. I think the majority of people uh, pr probably wouldn't have expected this line to come from Phyllis, but Jamie, Henry, Keisha, Kika, Kiki, Ambreen, Tanya, Justin, and Gator Tom. You guys all guessed it right. Congratulations. It was a little bit of a hard one. Let's see if you guys can get this one. A new quote for the week. I am going to light up the sky with my independence. That was a fun quote for the 4th of July week. What do you say? Who said it? I am going to light up the sky with my independence. If you think you know, go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. And if you get it right, next week's shout out will be yours. You know, damn it, we didn't have any follow-up on Chance this week. That was my burning question of last week, and I assumed that there would be some level of follow-up on what that connection between Chance and Adam is, and there was nothing. Maybe because it was a holiday week and they wanted to really, really dig into the whole carnival thing. The carnival thing was also a really nice uh, idea for the 4th of July week too because a lot of people had time off maybe some people were flipping through the channel saw that set thought it was cool and they're like hey soap operas are kind of different than they used to be maybe they got some new viewers I think the timing was good on that but it makes me a little angry that we didn't have any chance follow-up comments Sandra says I saw on YouTube that the role of Chance has been cast. The actor, the actor pictured in the video used to play Billy Jr. on Guiding Light years ago, so if it's true, I'd be happy. Also, there are rumors that Michelle Morgan is coming back, not as Hillary, of course, but as her doppelganger. That might be true, seeing as everyone close to Devon wants him to put Hillary in the rear view, just as he's packing up her things. I came across this rumor. Could be interesting to see what pants out. Ooh, okay, well, I haven't heard anything official about Chance or Hillary, but I have been asking myself, why are we why are we taking this step backwards on Devon's process? We already went through the anxiety, we already went through the therapy, uh, everything having to do with Hillary, and he was seeming real good 
and now all of a sudden we're right back to he's having trouble getting over Hillary and you make a really good strong point that if we just saw him packing up all her things and then her twin pops up in town that almost seems like it might be the uh, uh, an arc that would work could be a clue but yeah I'm, I, I, I'm curious to know about uh, Billy Jr. on Guiding Light I need to look that up I don't know I never believe any casting room any casting updates until I see him at CBS soaps in depth and they haven't had any casting updates on that at all I mean oh, I gotta get some new sources Mary Ann says I have read that Jess Walton is returning as Jill within the next two weeks so that could you know relate since she's Chance's grandmother. Oh, okay. Good, Marianne. Ooh, yay, Jill. First of all, yay, Jill. Second of all, yeah, that would be a perfect opportunity and reason to bring her back if we were going to see Chance too. Maybe YNR is just more tight-lipped about their official casting updates more than they used to be. Ah, <sighs> well, I mean, I I didn't see. Uh, anything about Calvin until the day that he appeared on screen. I didn't know we were actually going to see Chelsea's husband showing up in town, but I I make my daily trip to CBS Soaps in Depth, and there he was. News of Calvin's update. Uh, Jamie and Isabel says, it's a good thing Calvin is dead because we hated him. <laughs> he didn't give any kind of craps about Connor. He was cold. Uh, I'm getting the impression that the marriage was uh, like a business. They didn't even seem like a married couple. Yeah, I agree. It definitely wasn't a, a love marriage going on there. There was something up with Calvin, probably something nefarious. Gary says, I think Calvin was back from the dead, Graham, with facial reconstruction surgery. But I don't know why. <laughs> I know, yeah, right? He did have a Graham vibe. Wouldn't it have been great if we'd have found out he was related to Graham? There would have been a million different directions YNR could have gone with Calvin, but they just said, nope, dead in a week. <laughs> What's the point? What really is the point then of making Chelsea married? Hmm. I guess maybe just so that we didn't assume she was going to come back to town and jump right back into a relationship. I can't think of anything else. Well, Leslie liked Calvin. Leslie says Calvin redeemed himself and then kicked the bucket. I am so dumbfounded by Chelsea's attitude toward Adam and it is plain wrong and evil that she didn't bring Connor with her to see his father and should have done so as soon as she found out he was alive. I don't understand the extent of Victoria and Nick's attitude when they first heard he was alive, but Chelsea was no angel and loved him anyway. How could she want to hurt him now? It's all so contrived to make Adam the villain and to keep them apart so that they can slowly bring them back together. But with the way she's acting with Nick, they're not doing a very good job of it. They really don't have to take everything away from Adam. Chelsea's husband was more insightful and aware of Adam being heartbroken than the one who was devastated. And we saw her in anguish over the fact that Connor was not going to have Adam growing up. Ugh. Mm. It is kind of contrived, Leslie, isn't it? It, it? it does seem like they were taking Adam down the path of villain, 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 all so they could have the turn, which is, I think, what we're starting to see now. I mean, we saw a little bit of it last week. But, uh, yeah, I, it doesn't make sense to me either as to exactly why Chelsea is having this attitude toward Adam. And the question is... Who is she going to gravitate more to? We saw a preview where Adam is telling Chelsea, Oh good, your husband's dead. We can get back together now. And I'm going to assume that she's not going to jump on board with that right away. But it sounds like she's maybe, I mean, who knows? Maybe she's going to be pulled more toward Nick at first and then sway back toward Adam. But it does seem like they're building up a triangle there. Also at the end of Friday's show, we had Adam coming to the hotel scene where Calvin is being wheeled away by the EMTs after having croaked. 
Nick has arrived before him and is embracing Chelsea at inside the hotel room where her husband has died. And of course, also, Nick is the one Chelsea called when she found out her husband died or whatever the circumstances were. But Adam is on the outside looking in at that. And Phyllis, of course, is commenting, ooh, tough break, seeing uh, Nick and Chelsea over there embracing. So I think we, I think that scene, that, that end scene of Calvin on the stretcher, Nick embracing Chelsea, Adam looking over there at Chelsea and Nick embracing, and Phyllis making a little snarky comment about it, that sums up our story right there in one scene, in one moment. And we'll just see how it goes forward. T. Nicole says, it was interesting to hear Adam's perspective about how he felt uh, when he found out that Victor was his biological dad and the anger he felt. I still feel that Christian should stay with Nick, but this might give some insight on Adam's motives and state of mind. Adam feels the truth. Adam feels the truth that he is Christian and Connor's biological father will come out at some point in their lives and they will resent him the same way he feels toward Victor. Ooh, Tina Cole, good, 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 good. Yes, that's another reason I wish we could have seen that conversation between Adam and Calvin, because let's just say, let's assume it's on the surface and Adam just made a compelling argument to Calvin. Adam's just so charismatic and so understandable to, <laughs> to Calvin just turned him right around. Uh, I mean, it, it certainly is possible. And the fact that he was trying to talk to Chelsea about the way he found out that his real father was Victor and not the man who raised him. Maybe that created some background for his motives that the viewers can latch on to now. Yeah, yeah, great comment. <laughs> Astra says, um, did Adam poison Calvin? How come we didn't see their conversation? I thought Chelsea killed him at first since he wanted her to have his babies and that repulsed her. But after seeing the preview with Adam saying he and Chelsea can now be together, I'm convinced that Adam sabotaged Calvin when he came to talk to him. Hmm. Mm-mm. Well, see, the only thing about that is I'm struggling to understand what Adam's motive would have been. I mean, whether Adam knew it or not, Calvin had become an ally to him. I mean, Ka Calvin was getting ready to convince Chelsea to let Connor go to Adam. So I'm kind of leaning toward thinking that maybe Calvin was just a one week long clock device from Monday to Friday that was just there to create some drama. Maybe it was an accidental death. Honestly, I don't think we're gonna necessarily find out that either Adam or Chelsea had anything to do with his death. I bet you in the end, he just croaked. <laughs> <laughs> it was just there to create a little forward momentum of the plot and, and, and a dramatic death. They could have at least let it go on two weeks. Well, I don't know. We'll find out. Let's see here. Moving right along, Jinxie says that maybe black and white Tracy, Kane, and Paul can solve C uh, Calvin's murder. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Get them on the case. I just, I don't know, does, is everybody thinking that it's a murder? I guess I'm just um, judging by the tone of these new writers. Part of me thinks it's just gonna, it's just gonna be a little snap and a turnaround. It's gonna be an accident and we're gonna move forward mostly with that Adam, Chelsea, Nick triangle, that that's gonna be the focus. Zuberplex says, Chelsea is dead wrong, insisting that Adam should stay out of Connor's life. Does Chelsea even remember the circumstances under which Adam lost custody of Connor? He was incapacitated by a tranquilizing dart shot by Chloe, and she rigged the gas main of the cabin to explode. Everyone thought Adam was dead, and the explosion caused him to suffer from memory loss. In other wor worlds, Adam was removed from Connor's life through no fault of his own and only the consequence of his criminal acts performed by Chloe. Only 
uh, as a consequence of the criminal acts performed by Chloe. So why should one misdeed, Adam's attempted murder, be compounded by another misdeed, the loss of paternal authority, when the one who ought to suffer in this scenario should be Chloe? Yeah, I, I hear you. It's, it was, you know, Chloe was the one that literally lit the gas main. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with Adam choosing to not be a part of Connor's life. So Chelsea's attitude about, I don't know if maybe Nick got her fired up and afraid of losing custody of Connor and that's why she's behaving this way. I'm not sure. Adam didn't do anything wrong to Connor. He didn't do anything wrong in that situation at all. Uh, Anna makes a good point that Adam also never really said he wanted to take Connor away from Chelsea. He just said that he wanted him to know who his father really is. <sighs> I think Calvin must know something. Calvin must somehow have been obsessed with Chelsea and she only married him to keep him quiet about something. I get the feeling that her whole marriage to Calvin was about protecting Connor in some way. And maybe Chelsea was afraid that Adam's involvement would somehow blow up the little arrangement of protection that she had going on for him. Something more is there. I just don't know what it is. But Gary asks a good question here. Were Adam and Chelsea married when the cabin blew up? I knew they were romantic with each other, but were they married? I don't have the answer to that question. What was the status of Chelsea and Adam's relationship when the cabin blew up? I almost want to say she had already moved on and was involved with Nick at that point because wasn't Nick there when the cabin blew up? I mean, I know Adam had just been to prison. He'd been in prison, so I think Chelsea was growing close with Nick, but were they actually married? This is a good question to crowdsource here. Adam and Chelsea, were they married when the cabin exploded? Please leave a comment this week and uh, remind me, refresh me on that. Oh, let's switch gears. Daisy says, I loved seeing Kevin with Mariah, especially uh, talking about Oprah. It was so cute and such a great moment for those two friends. They seemed to fall right back into their friendship. I hope we see more of them, especially if they become amateur sleuths and investigate what Adam is really up to. Yeah, I think Mariah is gonna be on the case of what's up with Kevin. And it should be entertaining. I liked seeing them back together again this week too. Michelle says, Phyllis and Kevin's scenes have been the comedic relief we needed after all of the dark graveyard scenes. I love Greg Ricard's facial reactions to Phyllis's lines. Hilarious. Greg Ricard is so much better than I remember him being. Maybe it is all about dynamic and chemistry and who you have to play off of because I, I didn't remember Michelle Stafford being this good as Phyllis. And I honestly didn't remember Kevin being this, or Greg Ricard being this good as Kevin. But the, you zeroed in on his facial expressions. He listens and he reacts and he has a great funny reaction to everything that's going on in every scene. It is it is good. I, I, I was so skeptical about all of these casting changes that the new writers made when they took over and so far most of them have been great. I would say Adam is probably the, the one that has missed the mark the most for me, but also, I mean, I'm will, I am open and willing. I did not go into this all that excited about Phyllis and Kevin, and now here I am raving about him. Also, Gator Tom says, having Michelle Stafford back is such a dream come true. Her sarcasm, her style, her flirtation, and her playfulness was missed by this longtime YNR fan. Thank you, Gina, for keeping the character alive and well, and thank you, YNR, for deploying the character of Phyllis. Yep, good, good. Diana says it was hilarious when Michael insinuated that Phyllis may have had too much to drink already at her party and he made that gulping sound as he imitated her downing a drink. <laughs> I laughed out loud. I'm so glad that we're seeing more of him. 
Christian LeBlanc, Michael, this is another character who we are really seeing giving some performances. I mean, he's really doing body. Like, the, everybody is stepping it up. There were some scenes where he was in Phyllis's office really giving some hand gestures. And then you mentioned the scene at the party where he was giving a little, little bit of comedy there. I don't know if these guys have been, what have they been drinking? What have they been going through? Have they been doing some extra uh, imp improv classes or something? But yeah, the level is high. Loving it. Let's talk about uh, that poll having to do with Devon and his uh, moving on with Hillary. She, she or moving on from Hillary. Sheila says, "I'm so tired of everyone pushing Devon to get over Hillary. That poor woman has been dead for five minutes, and they want her packed up in a box and forgotten about." Poor Devon. That's where I fall on the spectrum, Sheila. But Anna says, "I think that Anna and Nate are right." Only because Devon is in a new relationship with Elena. Devon shows no signs of wanting to give up this relationship. Therefore, it seems to me that it's necessary for Devon to pack up his memories and give the relationship a fighting chance. You cannot have a shrine to Hillary and move on with Elena. That's true. I just never thought it was a shrine. I mean, shoot, Weiner didn't, they mentioned it all in the span of one week. I think that's why I think Calvin is a, a plot device because it almost seems like these writers are going in one week chunks. All of a sudden last week, there was a shrine to Hillary at Devon's house. Never heard a different word about it. It was just there and then we needed to overcome it. I wonder if that's their writing style. I just think they are creating arcs for the week and then they go away and next week we'll have a new arc and then it'll go away unless they they carry over but you know oh let's see let's get some comments about uh celeste tb84 says that uh, i remember lola's mom celeste mostly from csi miami so there's a connection to miami there um and as someone said before she hasn't changed a bit yeah, CSI in Miami. I don't watch the, the CSI shows, but uh, I think I did hear that that was where she was from. And so far, I'm really liking it. She's another high-level actress. I thought she seemed very comfortable in even her initial scenes. Right away, I, she seemed very warm with the other actress. I believe that she was Lola's mom. I, I could believe that she raised that girl from being little. There was just something about her that had a natural warmness. Um, and, and I really, I think that's why I liked her. I mean, I, not, I don't necessarily know that I'm going to love the character as much. I don't know what we've got in store for her, but so far I really love the actress. And now here's where we have to talk about the character and what the character's motives are. Diana says, Lola's mother was very bossy at the mansion when she suggested that her and Lola go back to the apartment because she was tired. She didn't have the courtesy to ask Lola and Kyle what their plans were for their 4th of July. She just assumed Lola was gonna follow her mother back to the apartment without giving it a second thought. I'm glad that Lola told her mother that her and Kyle were going to watch the fireworks and for her mother to go back to the apartment alone. It shows that Lola is a strong, independent woman who can make her own decisions without her mother telling her what to do. If Jack and Lola's mother get together, Jack looks like he will have his hands full with her. Yeah, I think that, that uh, maybe Lola took a cue from the lie about the apartment and decided, you know what, no, I need to be honest. I need to assert who I am to my mom. And maybe that's why she decided to do that with the 4th of July. But you do make a good point. Lola's mom is assuming that she's gonna get what she wants when she wants it. And that certainly applies to her daughter. And I'm wondering if she thinks it's gonna apply to Jack. Zuperplex says that Celeste is a real gold digger. Jack, run, run as fast as your tippy toes can get you. <laughs> Uh, T. Nicole says, I wonder if Celeste doesn't want Lola to marry Kyle, but her tactic is to be friendly and approving on the surface, but her pushing herself to live with Lola and Kyle, uh, uh, li living with Lola and getting Kyle out of the apartment is part of her scheme to break them up. It just seems too easy to have Kyle move out. I think Celeste has Lola already wrapped around her finger by just letting Kyle move back out to the pool house. Ooh. 
Well, why wouldn't she want Lola and Kyle to get married? What would be the motive for not wanting them to get married? Let me think. Um, I can't think of any. I could imagine that she would be happy to have her daughter marry an abbot and then she marries an abbot, but I don't know. Uh, T. Nicole, though, I love this point you make uh, saying, I would love to see how Celeste and Mia interact. They have such bold personalities. Ah, oh, this kills me. We're having Celeste and Mia would have been a really great dynamic for that Rosales family. What a shame. Well, we still have to see how Celeste interacts with her son, Ray. By the way, isn't it weird that there's almost no mention of Arturo? But I am looking forward to seeing how she has a, 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 an interaction with Ray. Astra says, am I the only one who thinks Mrs. Rosales looks more like she could be a rival for Sharon? for Ray's affection than being his mom. Mrs. Rosales looks like she could be Lola's mom, but not Ray's. The actress is beautiful. I guess I was just expecting a more mature looking woman. I did some research and there are, they are 15 years apart, Ray and, uh, Ray and his mom. So I guess Mrs. Rosales had Ray at 15, if we're looking at real life ages. I don't know if that's the story they're gonna give on the show, but props to the actress for looking so good. I never would have guessed she was in her 50s. She looks a lot younger major big head wagging there. She looks good. Really, really good. But Tony says the writers are being very disconnected about the ages when recasting characters. It makes it difficult to follow a story. I keep having to imagine each character in their appropriate age to get a sense of the storyline. Adam is now younger than Sharon's son Noah, so I have to keep picturing regular aged Adam playing these scenes. This young one is unbelievable in the current story blending. It's different than the younger man, older woman storyline that's genuine. And Ray's mother is younger than he is. And Lola's about 15 to Kyle and Summer in their mid twenties. If they recast Victor, maybe he can play in the band with Reed. <laughs> oh, you mean maybe Victor can jam with Reed? <laughs> that was a fun little moment at the carnival, right? Victor picking up that, uh, that lingo from, from Reed. Oh, I loved Victor and Nikki at the carnival, by the way. Oh, they were so cute. Nikki carrying around the bear. And then like she, she had a moment where she had a box of popcorn and she went to kind of eat it with her tongue. And I thought, oh, well that's very realistic. You know, when the popcorn gets really high in the tub and you just like, rather than get in it with your fingers, you just go for the tongue. <laughs> She did that and I thought it was cool. But back to your point, I, the age differences always get me at first. It, like, and I'm shocked and I, even Calvin being older, but then I usually settle into it. it. It's interesting to hear that there are still some people who are having some trouble making that leap. Is anybody else out there still struggling with the age differences? Let me know. Oh, good point from Keisha. Where in the world is Sam Ashby? Kane hasn't mentioned that child at all. We see Kane out and about in Genoa City, but we never see him at least pushing a baby stroller. He's planning a trip to New York City with Tracy. Still no mention of Sam's well-being. There was a carnival in town this week. Kane took Tracy and didn't think to bring his little boy. In my opinion, Wyatt Armour missed the perfect opportunity uh, to see Sam Ashby. No kidding, Keisha. Man, I didn't even think of that. Maybe they're trying to steer away from making Tracy look too motherly by inserting Sam into that equation because I think maybe they're needing to do some work to pull Tracy out of being that motherly figure so that she can actually have a romantic story with Kane. So maybe there's a reason behind it, but I mean, you make a totally excellent point. Kane has a little baby that we never hear anything about. I guess we just need to wash that away for now. Hey, Sheila says, I know it's cold in Wisconsin in the winter and apparently in society in the summer. Gotta love a roaring fireplace in July. <laughs> and Lisa J says, what is up with all these folks wearing cocktail dresses and high heels to the carnival? <laughs> yeah, it's a little off, isn't it? The fireplace in society I assumed was fake. Uh, but maybe it's real, I'm not sure. Uh, but that is a little odd for the middle of the summer. And of course, cocktail dresses at the carnival. I mean, the, the way people, again, dress at the Genoa City Carnival is far more classy than the kind of dress 
you're gonna see at the real life carnival. Probably far less like sweaty bo too. Ugh. But okay, just speaking of dresses, I loved Chelsea's white and red striped uh, like uh, jumpsuit that she was wearing. It was perfect for carnival. That whole thing with a bow in the middle and the tie. That whole thing said carnival with the red and white stripes. That was a perfect, perfect fashion choice. There's a lot of jumpsuits on the show right now. That must be the style. I can't pull it off, but I love that these guys are pulling it off. Uh, yeah, carnival fashion. We should have done a whole segment on carnival fashion. Best and worst dressed. How about we just do it now? Best and worst dressed for the carnival. My vote is Chelsea for best. Uh, I'll have to put my brain into thinking about who was the worst. I'll think about that one. Well, let's end on a fun little uh, note from Laura. Laura says, if it weren't for Kevin's illegalities, he'd be my best friend. Ch commenting about Kevin saying, yeah, Chelsea's hanging out with some old guy. <laughs> Kevin's hilarious. Ooh, so Kevin would be your best friend, Laura, in real life. This is a good question for everybody. So if everyone on YNR right now, if you got to pick who would be your best friend, who would you pick? Ooh. <laughs> Go to yrchat.com this week and tell me and tell Laura who your best friend would be of all of the characters on the show. That's a good juicy question. I want to read, read some of your comments uh, next week and we'll pick our besties. Okay, everybody, it's time for this bestie to get going. I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday, a wonderful week. Head on over to the website. Leave me some comments. It's always fun to get your feedback, especially throughout the week. I had some technical glitches this week, like my entire computer crashed, and so things, I didn't get screen caps and all that up at the website quite as quickly. Gah. But I got everything fixed. I am back on track, and I will be back next week just the same. I love you guys. Have a really great one.